can open your Bibles to John chapter 6. I want to first of all confess that I hope I live up to the liturgy. Now what I mean by that is that uh, if you could see the order of service here, uh, it has um, in the order of service, short message. (laughs) And so when uh, Joey asked me to uh, speak tonight uh, and I felt drawn to John chapter 6, I kind of just got into the passage and everything and just kind of got lost in it. And uh, I sent the PowerPoints to Joey and then he had a little talk with me. And and so I've cut things down, but uh, I'm looking forward to this opportunity here. I have PowerPoints. I don't know if you can get them on this. Yeah. So uh, let me just pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon our message tonight. Lord, we thank you for today and for just the the many expressions of worship throughout the day, times of prayer, fasting, seeking you. And now, Lord, we come to this time in the service in which we will open your word and we want to hear from you through the scriptures. And so, Lord, I pray that you would teach us all. Lord, I ask that you would give us a teachable spirit, that you would quicken our minds and soften our hearts. And Lord, I pray for myself that uh, as your person for this passage at this moment, Holy Spirit, I am dependent upon you to do something of spiritual significance over these next few minutes. And so, Lord, teach us your word. May Yeshua be glorified, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. So I want to speak to you from John chapter 6, and uh, we're just going to uh, uh, look at a couple of verses tonight. But if you were to go to Bellevue Square and walk around and ask some folks What is the prerequisite to go to heaven? What would you think you would hear? In terms of our culture and everything. What what would be the prerequisite to go to heaven? Well, you might hear be good. When you look at this culture, one of the strong lies that is out there is that the only prerequisite to go to heaven is you got to die. (laughs) When you look at this culture, you know, you look at social media and and, and all that, uh, heavenly birthday wishes and all, you know, it's like everybody's going there. The only prerequisite is that you have to die. But when we look at uh, the scriptures and we look at what uh, Yeshua tells us, we know that uh, there is something much, much more that uh, must be done and that uh, we need to look to him. And so uh, I'd like to, he he speaks of this many places, but I'm going to uh, just draw out what he says from John chapter 6 in terms of what is necessary to go to heaven. This is John chapter 6, and uh, I entitled this, as you can see, Accepting Yeshua, very simple title. So let's read it together. Uh, John 53. I'm going to read the entire passage, then I'm kind of just going to park on uh, the early verses there. John chapter 6, verse 53 says, So the Shua said to them, Amen, Amen. I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, You have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. 
Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who eats of me will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread of your fathers, not like the bread your fathers ate and then died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now, the context here is in the earlier part of John chapter 6, uh, Yeshua has uh, fed the 5,000 men. That's what the scripture tells us. That means, well, there's probably wives and kids there. It could have been 10, 15,000 with just a few little loaves and a couple of fishes. And uh, uh, everyone ate. And you remember, uh, there's uh, 12 baskets of leftovers and, and all that. And then uh, they leave and go to another part of uh, the area. And it's um, <clears throat> now the next day. And the crowd, realizing that Yeshua left, uh, they are on the hunt. And they go to where he is. And uh, actually, they're showing up looking for breakfast. <laughs> Because they thought it was a pretty good deal. You know, this, maybe the Messiah did come. And uh, he's going to, you know, provide food. We got a little welfare state going on. And, you know, let's just uh, <laughs> let the gravy keep rolling. And so they show up. And then he begins to teach about being the bread of life. You see, he wasn't thinking about physical bread. But he was thinking about an illustration concerning spiritual bread. And as he teaches about the bread of life, he then makes this rather striking statement. Eat my body, drink my blood. You know, it's like, oh, what, 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 what's this all about, you know? And it, it, it's shocking. And it is a, a difficult uh, passage. Uh, there are... Uh, different opinions out there in terms of what exactly uh, uh, can be taken from this. The Catholic Church has taken it to a place where Yeshua never intended it to be. Uh, this is the passage where they get their whole doctrine of what's called transubstantiation. Maybe you've heard of that. That's where in the Mass, when the priest lifts the cup and the bread in the air, uh, they believe that it turns into the literal flesh and blood of Christ. But uh, uh, that uh, is an extreme interpretation. But it is a striking saying. And what is he trying to convey when he says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood? Well, what he's talking about is he's talking about his death and uh, accepting he and his work on the cross. Uh, in terms of, uh, let's see, what am I doing here? There we go. Okay, so um, the, as we look at this, this gonna be, was going to be my first point. It's going to be my only point tonight. And that is, without Yeshua, there is no spiritual life. That is, in other words, no Yeshua, no spiritual life. And we see this here in verse 53. Let me read it again to you. So Yeshua said to them, Amen, amen, I tell you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. Now, when he says, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, here he's talking, looking ahead to what he knows is coming, and that is that his, at some point, his body is going to be nailed to a cross, and uh, he will give his life in this horrific form of death. And when he says, and drink his blood, he is again looking ahead to what is going to come in the future when he knows that his blood that is shed will be the payment that God the Father will receive 
for the sin of all who trust and believe in Yeshua. And so he's looking ahead and he's referring to his work on the cross. And he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. And he's talking, obviously, of spiritual life in yourselves. And so here he's talking about how he and he alone is the way of salvation. That there aren't multiple options out there and you can choose whatever option you want or neglect all the options and somehow everything's going to work out and you'll go to heaven if we can use that language. No, he and he alone is the only way to go and experience the holiness of God in heaven. I think of what he says in John, John chapter uh, uh, 14. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. Let me see. There we go. John chapter 14, well, where he says in verse 6, Yeshua said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty exclusive speech there. No one. Doesn't matter if you're sincere and you look to Buddha. Doesn't matter if you're sincere and you look to Muhammad. Doesn't matter if you're sincere and that you are knocking on doors as a Jehovah Witness. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the only way. Peter spoke of that. In uh, <clears throat> Acts chapter uh, 4, and he says uh, in verse 12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Peter says salvation is no place else other than with Yeshua. It is in no one else. He is speaking of the exclusivity of Yeshua. Now, in this exclusivity, Yeshua says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not be saved. Now, there's something with the clicker. It goes back to number one each time. Yeah. Okay, uh, and, and so I want to have us just think about this eating my flesh and drinking his blood. Why would he use this analogy? What, what is the correlation between eating and drinking that uh, would cause Yeshua to use this as an illustration or an analogy? What is it about eating and drinking? Well, let's just think about that for... And I got four things I'm going to say very quickly about it. And hopefully... Oh, there it goes. I hope I don't have to go to back to one each time. <laughs> oh, I don't mean to be distracting. I'll, you, I'll go without it. Okay. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so... I uh, won't be able to put it on the PowerPoint, uh, but, uh, so I'm just, I'll tell you it verbally. Maybe there's only four slides up there, but okay. So what does he, why does he use this analogy, okay? Four, four reasons why he uses the analogy. First one is this. Eating and drinking is a necessary act if I'm going to derive any advantage from the bread or the wine. Okay? It is a necessary act if I'm going to derive any advantage from the bread. In order for me to gain any, any nutrients or any, any benefit from the bread, I have to eat it. Now, I love bread. <laughs> you can see I love bread. <laughs> And uh, I grew up in a house where my mom, uh, she uh, would make bread from time to time. In fact, when she made bread, she usually made cinnamon rolls at the same time. And I'd come home from school, and I'd smell those smells. And uh, she would say, uh, Joe, you can have just one. 
You either can have a slice of bread or you can have a cinnamon roll. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of basking in the smell. And, uh, well, it was a hard choice, but what did I choose? No, I chose the bread. <laughs> Nothing better than a slice of warm bread with a slab of butter on it. And it was just so good, so good. Now, I could go to that bread and I could say, you know, it looks like bread. And I could touch it and feel it and say, you know, it feels like bread. And I could even bring it up and smell it. And I say, yeah, it smells like bread. But I haven't benefited from it yet. What do I have to do to benefit from the bread? I have to eat it. That's right. I have to eat it. And that is what just a necessary part. In order to get any benefit, you have to eat it. Well, it's the same way with Yeshua. You see, we can intellectually understand, yes, there was a Yeshua 2,000 plus years ago. Yes, he was born of a virgin. Yes, he grew and he was a wise teacher and he did these miracles. And we can even intellectually understand that, um, you know, that he uh, died and was buried and rose again from the grave. But intellectually understanding that, just kind of recognizing that that maybe is true, is not enough. It's not enough. Just like recognizing that that piece of bread is, uh, you know, okay, a piece of bread, we have to take it to that next level and eat the bread or receive Yeshua as Savior. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was preaching, and I used John 3.16, a great verse, which you all know, John, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, remember I said believe, we can understand that something like a chair is a chair, and we can say it feels like a chair, it looks like a chair, but what do we have to do to believe that it's a chair? We have to sit in it. And that's the same thing that Yeshua is saying here. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, that is, unless you totally take it in uh, and, and, and let it do what it's designed to do, there is no benefit. In order to uh, gain from the eating... Eating is necessary if I'm going to derive any benefit from the bread. And the uh, same is true with Yeshua. That's the first reason why he uses that analogy. Second reason that he uses that analogy is this. Eating is a response to a felt need. Eating is a response to a felt need. Okay, are we up and running? Okay, good. Um, and so... Many of us have been fasting to, to one degree or another today, and I imagine you're hungry. That's a, a felt need, okay? It's a felt need. And uh, how do you uh, alleviate that felt need? Well, you have to eat. And as you can see, I have my issues with, I love to eat, and I love food and such, and, and that we all enjoy uh, having our hunger satisfied. And when you have uh, had a great meal and uh, you've, uh, you know, eaten, you know, just all these delicious entrees and things and salads, when you complete the meal, well, then you don't want to eat because you're, you're satisfied. You, you've had enough. Food is actually maybe even... Not anything that you want right then. Maybe some of you have been in situations where on a holiday you've had to have lunch at one set of relatives and then go have dinner at another set. Like the last thing you want to do is eat again, but uh, that's what people are expecting. Well, um, uh, eating is this response to a felt need. I'm hungry, I want to eat, so therefore I eat. Well, Yeshua uses this for the same reason, this, this illustration. You see, every human ever born is spiritually hungry. It was Aquinas, I believe, that said that men and women are born with a God-shaped void. And uh, that God-shaped void is something that longs to be filled. Now, sadly, there are many people out there that try to fill it with things other than God, 
but it is that spiritual void that longs to be filled with, um, with uh, uh, a satisfying spiritual substance, uh, meeting my spiritual need. And so with Yeshua, what he's saying here is that he is the one that satisfies that need. Uh, you remember, uh, we won't turn to it, I don't have it on the screen, uh, John chapter 4, uh, Yeshua is traveling up through Samaria and he stops by the well and there's that woman uh, who comes out for water and they have this wonderful interaction about living water and a water that in which if you drink it, you will thirst no more. That's the kind of satisfaction that Yeshua provides. And so when he talks about you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's talking about receiving a spiritual satisfaction that comes from him and him alone. And so he uses that illustration. Third thing that uh, he, uh, that we know about eating and why he uses this is eating implies an act of appropriation. It implies an act of appropriation. You see, when I eat my slice of bread and uh, chew it and enjoy the taste and then swallow it, it goes into my very body. And the cells of that bread or the cells of the other food items that I eat, they then begin to mingle in the digestive process with my own body's cells. And there is this sense of inclusion of the cells doing what, they're, the, what cells do. I'm not a scientist, but there's this appropriation. And the eating implies that there is this appropriation. Well, Yeshua has the same thing in mind. When he says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, he is speaking of a righteousness. You look at Scripture and it is filled from beginning to end about a righteousness that is not our own. And that we as human beings, our righteousness is as filthy rags. But Christ in his perfect obedience, his righteousness is a righteousness that we are in desperate need of. And as we trust Yeshua and his work on the, Christ, and his work on the cross, uh, that righteousness is then given to us. It is imputed, I think we've used that word from time to time, deposited into our lives. In fact, uh, again, I often mention this verse, and I'll mention it again, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Such, I mean, all scripture's important, but that verse, he who had no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. That's a double imputation. Our sin, he who had no sin, our sin then goes to him, and that's what he paid the penalty for on the cross, and his righteousness is then imputed or deposited to us so that when God looks at us, he sees our righteousness. It, this is the kind of appropriation that he is speaking of here, and that's why Yeshua uses this in uh, his uh, uh, dealing with the whole issue of the bread of life. And then the last one that uh, I just want to bring our attention to is that eating is personal. And Yeshua used this because eating is personal. In other words, in order to benefit from eating, it's something that we, we got to do ourselves. Okay, we got to do it ourselves. We can't have someone else eat for us. There's no gain if we have someone else. Yeah, I can't call up Lynn and say, oh, cutie, I'm, you know, I'm so busy today. I got writing and I'm studying and I got to get this article out. I, I just don't have time to eat. Would you go down to Burger King and get a Whopper and, uh, and, and then eat it for me and have me be satisfied? No, there's no gain to me with her eating something. It has to be done by the individual. And my friends, this is what Yeshua is talking about here. And that is that there are no proxy Christians. You have to personally receive Yeshua. 
You have to eat his flesh, drink his blood, accept him as your Lord and Savior. Your sister may have done it years before. You may have had an aunt. You may have had a mom. You may have had, you know, a brother go down that uh, respond to an altar call. And those are all good things. But you, you have to accept him as your personal Savior. Again, I don't have it on the screen, but Romans 10, 9. If you you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It says, confess with your, your mouth, and believe in your heart that Yeshua is Lord, and you will be saved. It is something that we personally must do. And so, when Yeshua says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no eternal life. It is necessary. Eat his flesh, drink his blood, in order to be saved. And so as I just bring this to a close, I just want to ask you, where are you tonight in terms of what is your relationship to Yeshua? Have you come to a place where you have personally trusted him? Come to a place where you personally have accepted him as your Lord and Savior where you look to him and him alone for forgiveness of sin. You have invited him into your heart. You've internalized him. You have eaten of his body and have drank his blood. I trust that's your testimony. Lord, we just thank you for these moments in which we have looked at what you have instructed us in terms of accepting you as Savior. And Lord, I pray that that if there's anyone here tonight that hasn't come to that place where they have eaten your flesh or drank your blood, that is accepted you and trust you and you alone, for the forgiveness of their sins, I pray that in the quietness of this moment, they would embrace you.